thanks very much, Marco, for that very generous introduction. I'd sort of like to meet the guy you described. But, um, I'm not sure I can live up to it, but I'll see what I can do. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming out. Thanks uh, for inviting me. I've had a great time talking to graduate students and faculty members and look forward to, to further engagement with people. A um, few words about where this comes from. So as Marco said, this is a, a chapter from a recently completed manuscript called Post-Postmodernism which is largely an attempt to suggest that much of the work on postmodernism was done in the late 70s and published in the 1980s, and that we live, and much of it had to do with sort of historicizing, kind of uh, historicizing versions of where we were, where late capitalism was at that point. And I think we no longer live in the world of the mid-80s, right? Globalization, uh, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, <clears throat> um, the internet, uh, the sort of uh, intensifications of finance capital in, in those years means that we live in a slightly different kind of world, but we still use a lot of that vocabulary from postmodernism as if it actually did describe the place where we live. So the book, at some level, follows the template of the toolbox, and it takes a series of terms from postmodernism, commodity, deconstruction, the, the sort of the words that people use in postmodernism, and tries to talk about how they may be, how they may be useful or understandable in a different way some 25 years hence. Um, so can literature be equipment for post-postmodern living is, is an attempt to take the, 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 the word literature, right, which is a central component of most postmodern thinking, and try to suggest how its uses um, and its um, difficulties may have uh, shifted over the past 25 years or so. Um, <clears throat> one other, and much of what I'm doing also in terms of the, the stuff on affirmation, I'm trying to sort of move from a postmodern hermeneutics of suspicion um, to what a friend of mine calls a hermeneutics of situation, which is to say less a matter of you know what does this mean or how can one use this as a bulwark to um, against totalizing meaning, but what is this good for now? Right, and some of this is also worked out in the Foucault book. But I'm trying to think less in terms of you know how these, if com you know commodity or deconstruction or literature as terms from postmodernism, I'm not, not attempting to suggest that they're useless, but they're because the world around it has changed to some degree, the uses of these things may also have to be. Um, so that's the hermeneutics of situation, what is this good for, rather than the hermeneutics of suspicion, you know, what, what does this mean? In any case, uh, it begins with an epigraph, uh, users don't read, uh, which is a web design truism. Um, it's not much of an exaggeration to say that literature was king during the academic postmodern revolution of the late 20th century. Taking the linguistic turn as its central premise, postmodern theorizing in myriad disciplines turned to avant-garde poetics and narrative as models for what the world feels like if it's structured like a language, if indeed, in Derrida's words, there is nothing outside the text, or there is no extra text. In short, the linguistic turn of postmodernism made textual skills, reading and interpretation, central to discourses and disciplines that formerly had very little overt traffic with the ins and outs of language. From the study of history and philosophy, to the workings of the unconscious and subjective identity, even as far afield as economics and the life sciences, a Saussurian version of language, that socially constructed place where there are no positive terms, only differences. So here's famous phrase. Language was the postmodern paradigm that overcoated all the others. And insofar as literature was, to steal a phrase from Kenneth Burke, equipment for living in the postmodern era, it specifically served as equipment for making your way through this world saturated with the lacks and gaps so characteristic of literary hermeneutics. Undecidable meanings, undecipherable codes, unconscious desires, uncertain values, unforeseen plot twists. The postmodern world was a world where reading or interpretation, specifically understood as the act of inhabiting and maybe suturing these narrative gaps or aporias, was the primary pivot. The referential guarantees of essentialism, the positive terms, were dead in all the academic disciplines, so meaning throughout the humanities had to be made rather than found. And what better laboratory than, liter than literature for studying those anti-essentialist meaning-making operations? But over the past 15 years or so, there's been a slow but decisive turn away from the linguistic turn in the North American academic world. This has perhaps been most obvious, ironically, in literary studies, which has turned away from interpreting texts, from pivoting on questions about textual meaning and its discontents, to examining the historical, archival, scientific, biological, and political context of literary production. Likewise, other humanities and social sciences discourses have quietly abandoned the linguistic turn. Economics has completely ter re-territorialized on math themes, and if you told anyone working in contemporary academic psychology departments or in language acquisition research that the unconscious is structured like a language, they'd think you were crazy. 
Likewise, academic sex and gender studies were in the 1980s and 1990s nearly synonymous with the performative identity and linguistic theories of Judith Butler and Eve Sedgwick, just as postcolonial theory was for a long time taken with Homi Baba's language-based theories of dissemination, dissemination and hybridity, but not so much anymore, which is to say language is no longer the, the sort of primary thing that organizes all these other fields. Even in continental philosophy, arguably the home of the linguistic turn, it seems that the deconstructive phase of axiomatic linguistic mediation has been eclipsed. Deleuze is perhaps the thinker du jour, and Deleuze's wide-ranging corpus is, one might argue, held together primarily by his consistent and harsh critique of the linguistic term. Nowadays, even sympathetic Derridians like Catherine Malibu suggest that if deconstruction is to live on, it needs to move beyond its myopic focus on the literary suture of equiture, of writing. Finally, one might note that in recent biological research, where Malibu suggests we turn our attention, life itself is no longer primarily understood on the genomic analogy, analogy of the book, where life contains a secret code requiring the scientist's interpretation, um, but rather on the model of the microscopic or the molecular, the smallest particles that might be manipulated by researchers. So, with an ironic nod to Marx, one might say that contemporary biology is not mere, merely interested in interpreting genes, but in changing them, and thereby financializing them. And this is maybe what biology has most decisively in common with its various sibling academic fields who are fleeing the linguistic turn. They participate in a general movement away from the postmodern metaphorics of socially constructed deviation, which is the literary problem par excellence, filling gaps and working through undecided abilities, to examining more direct modes of biopolitical and economic manipulation, from a focus on understanding something to a concern with manipulating it, from postmodern meaning to post-postmodern usage, one might say. But as any web designer or technical writer will tell you, users don't read. Right? So if you've gone from reading to usage, you have sort of a problem that's created for readers. Maybe a linchpin for all these disparate anti-hermeneutic maneuvers is found in Foucault's work on biopower, which Foucault diagnoses as a form of power that works on bodies differently from the institutional mediations of disciplinary training. Rather than functioning at a series of link, as a series of linked practices at play in scattered disciplinary sites, the hospital, the family, the school, the workplace, and so on, Foucault sees biopower as a new type of power that works on bodies really and directly, these are his words, um, at every point in the power-saturated socius. So, for example, your disciplinary identity as a soldier or a student is mediated through training in a specific institution, the army or the school. On the other hand, your biopolitical identity, your sexuality, for example, is under constant construction at all times everywhere, inside and outside the training grounds of institutions. What Randy Martin calls the financialization of everyday life over the past few decades is likewise one of the most widespread markers of this smear of power into places where it previously didn't travel. But the infiltration of subject, subjective, <clears throat> excuse me, much like the infiltration of subjective identity questions into spaces of work, the idea, now ubiquitous, that your job is a self-actualization technique rather than a means to garner their free time to ponder or make your own self-actualization. Right? This is also an intense and emergent smear of biopolitics. In short, subjective identity questions have mutated from previously rarefied realms like literature into the office cubicle, the factory floor, and all kinds of other places where they didn't prior, in prior regimes go. To put it another way, if you understand social power as working inexorably through institutional mediation, then language is a key methodological tool insofar as language is a figure for social mediation in its most widespread and inescapable form. However, if mediation at privileged institutional sites has given way to direct access of various kinds, if your whole life, public and private, is the surface area of biopower rather than discrete parts of your life that discipline worked on one at a time, then language will also, it seems, be eclipsed as a primary grid of intelligibility. When power is at work literally and figuratively everywhere, on the surface of life itself, then spaces of mediation between the subject and the socius, the body and the state, science and literature, and so on, are no longer privileged fields where the agon of social power and resistance is worked out in its most intense manner. Language and literature were king in the postmodern era precisely because they were the most economical markers for the experience of a social world where essentialism had lost its, its, its explanatory focus, and the mediations of social construction were the questions du jour. And again, if understanding an anti-essentialist world of endless mediation is the problem, then language and literature comprise the most obvious place to look for a solution, or at least a grid for understanding how the problem works. If not, probably not. In other words, maybe this post-postmodern anti-language or anti-hermeneutic set of stances is not exactly a return to essentialism, as some have charged, 
but rather a recognition that not all deployments of force, social, biological, historical, unconscious, and so on, can easily or satisfactorily be modeled on a Saussurean understanding of linguistics. That we're looking at a mutation or evolution of paradigms rather than a simple return to an essentialist past. Indeed, 50 years hence, one imagines that people will puzzle somewhat over why so many people in the 20th century thought that language was the privileged paradigm for understanding literally everything else. In a slightly different kind of language, one might say that if fragmentation was the watchword of postmodernism, then of course reading follows as postmodernism's linchpin practice, largely through synecdoche. The hermeneutic conundrums of literature, especially kind of avant-garde or difficult literature, functioned as the part that stood in for the whole of the postmodern world of piecing together undecidable, oh, excuse me, undecidables. Post-postmodernism, on the other hand, seems to take intensification, the increased spread and penetration, as its paradigmatic ethos, with globalization as its primary practice, all access, all the time. And this historical shift of focus or orientation inverts, and I think maybe even destroys, literature's privileged synecdochic role. In short, our critical work throughout the human in our current critical work throughout the humanities, we tend no longer to go to the revelatory part in the hopes of grasping the larger whole, arguing, for example, that reading Gravity's Rainbow gives us a window into the workings of the world at large. Rather, we now tend to start with a larger post-postmodern whole, something like globalization, of which any particular part, say literature, is a functioning piece. To repurpose a quote from Gravity's Rainbow, it may be that post-postmodernism, quote, is not a disentanglement from, but a progressive nodding into. And if that's the case, the disentanglement function of literature, the interruptive hermeneutic power of reading's hesitating slowness, its questioning of meaning, becomes increasingly less useful as a way to engage the super-fast post-postmodern world. To put it very crudely, in a world of economic globalization, flat, though unevenly so to say the least, it's not clear that mediated representations or signs matter as much as direct flows of various kinds, money, goods, people, images. And the question posed by this historical novelty to literary research is obvious. Whither poetics or literary criticism or literature itself in a world where language and its workings are no longer the primary privileged pivots? What's the role of literature in a world where language is no longer the central humanities concern as it was in this, throughout the second half of the 20th century. So section two, wither poetics. Unfortunately, much of the literary world's response to this colonization of everyday life by an emergent post-postmodernism <laughs> has relied on a kind of linguistic nostalgia. If literature has any use value or offers us any equipment for living after postmodernism, that value remains primarily thematized as a kind of antiquarian slowing down of all the super fast flows that characterize the post-postmodern world. Just the other morning, I heard a Pulitzer Prize winning contemporary author say just this on Where Else, NPR. Uh, quote, the world is so insanely complex and fast and distracting, and one of the things I think a good book can do is slow the reader's attention down a little bit and give them, say, a chance to think through some of the consequences of these changes, which otherwise are so quick that all you can do is react. This kind of sentiment is unfortunately not very far from seemingly more sophisticated or radical attempts within contemporary literary theory to reinvigorate an ethics of close reading or to rekindle various other high modernist theoretical nostrums concerning the autonomous resistance importance of reading or resistant importance of reading or interpretation. Continuing the line of reasoning laid out in modern and postmodern mediations on literature in the 20th century, many contemporary gambits concerning poetics as equipment for living continue to suggest that literature's real use value is that it has none. Literature functions as a mode of inexorable slowness, maybe interruption on a good day, in the too fast world of capitalism. And as such, it indexes the old dream of poetics as the last remaining realm that's semi-autonomous from a world of getting and spending. A primal scene for this kind of critical investment in postmodern literature is, arguably, constituted by the response of poets and critics to Frederick Jameson's notorious use of Bob Perlman's poem, China, in his famous postmodernism essay, Jameson's. According to the critical response offered by those interested in defending avant-garde poetics from Jameson's positioning of it, Jameson is perhaps right when he says that postmodern architecture or robust markets and museum art are synonymous with late capitalism and the structural position that it affords to a formerly autonomous notion of aesthetic innovation, but not so avant-garde poetics. In other words, contemporary avant-garde poetry is not really a symptom of late capital saturation, as Jameson suggests. Rather, its defenders argue such linguistically 